far as that. Well, he heard the other. He heard someone else got the job, but he <laughs> took off. Here it is, snowing after a beautiful weekend, everyone's laughing. I don't know what's wrong. <laughs> so, uh, well, hey, welcome team. I know that uh, Commissioner Decker has already let us know she will not be here this evening for either meeting. And so it's nice to see everybody. Uh, I'm gonna officially call this uh, Count, City of Kalamazoo Committee of the Whole meeting to order for Monday, April 17th. 2023, and our first order of business is to call the roll. Commissioner Decker. Commissioner Hess. Present. Commissioner Hoffman. Present. Commissioner Juarez. Halfway present. <laughs> Commissioner Bradel. <laughs> present. Approved. Vice Mayor Cooney. Present. Mayor Anderson. Here. May I have a motion to excuse Commissioner Decker from this so meeting? Moved. Motion made by Commissioner Hoffman. Support. Swear by Commissioner Hess. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Okay, uh, team, we have a problem down here at the end. I, I, I don't know if there's some peer pressure that can be applied, but. <laughs> okay, so I, I'm assuming that that was 100% for uh, approving. Yes. Okay. Uh, Manager Risma, any communications? None, Your Honor. Thank you, Manager Risma. Now is the opportunity for public comments during our committee of the whole meeting. So just a reminder, uh, for anyone who's listening in, there will be a public comment period during our regular business meeting that starts at 7. Uh, the public comment period is a little shorter for this meeting. Uh, first thing we'll do is see if there's anyone in the chambers. I don't, doesn't look like it is going to want to make a public comment. Uh, and then we will check to see if anyone has called in. Just a reminder, uh, please give us your name, whether you live in the city, and you will have two minutes. Deputy City Manager Chamberlain, has anybody called in? All right. We'll go ahead and check here. No, we do not. Thank you, DCM Chamberlain. Appreciate your work on that, always. Uh, so now we are into our work session, and we are honored, obviously, to have Jane Ghost here from Discover Kalamazoo, but Manager Ritzman, do you want to kick this yeah. off? Yeah, we have two exciting presentations this evening. First, uh, Mrs. Jane Ghosh from Discover Kalamazoo will present, and then our Emergency Preparedness and Resource Manager, Brandy James, will give us an update on emergency management. So, Ms. Goach. It's a pleasure to be here tonight. Um, I came to talk to you about four things today, but I'm also here to answer any questions you might have. So the first is just to remind you what uh, Discover Kalamazoo does and give you an update on the latest we have on visitor spending in our community. Um, share with you, we've got a new geolocation provider. I'm gonna share with you some information from that. Talk to you about our strategy and some initiatives. And then lastly, and with what upcoming events we have. And time allowing, I have an extra little update, but we'll, we'll decide on that based on time. So um, first, just as a reminder, Discover Kalamazoo is the Convention and Visitors Bureau for Kalamazoo County. So we market Kalamazoo County as a destination for travelers, whether they be here for leisure or business or events. Our mission, this is slightly updated, just to clarify what we do. Our mission is to attract and wow visitors for the economic advancement of our county. So we bring them here and we hope they have a great time and that has, we'll talk about the economic impact of that. Um, we got recently updated visitor spending numbers from 2021. So we get this data via Travel Michigan, the Pure Michigan folks at MEDC. Um, we just got this at the beginning of the year. It takes a long time for them to calculate, so over a year. Um, in 2021, visitor spending in Kalamazoo County was $585 million, and you can see how that broke out. Number one remains in Kalamazoo County, food and beverage. So when visitors come to our county, the number one place they spend their money is in restaurants and bars and so forth, number two being lodging. 
that supports directly more than 6,000 jobs, and it's actually 8.4% of county employment. So while you don't think of Kalamazoo County, Kalamazoo County as a travel destination like Orlando or New York, in fact, it really does matter you know, to our county. Um, and the great news is that that visitor spending in 2021 was actually higher than in 2019. So we had assumed it would take us until 2023 to get back to where we were before the pandemic. Um, but we actually had a miraculous recovery. Yeah, exactly. Go, go team. Great recovery there. Um, and we actually had, when you compare 2021 visitor spending to 2020 visitor spending, we were the second fastest growing county of all the 83 counties in Michigan. Um, the only county that grew a little faster than us was Lake County, and they were growing off a very small base because they really don't have a lot of the, the tourism that Kalamazoo County does. So, um, you know, there's a lot of factors that went into that. We were, in a sense, kind of lucky um, in that we don't rely on international travel. We're not as reliant on the really big conventions like a city like Detroit might have. And we benefit from some of the same things that helped um, destinations uh, in Michigan in 2020 that were more outdoorsy destinations. We had kind of the best of both worlds, and we think that's really what helped our recovery in 2021. That and my, my awesome team and all of our partners. Um, so these are our Kalamazoo values, discover Kalamazoo values. Just to remind you, you know, our number one is we are outstanding ambassadors. That's the core of our job. We embrace diversity, equity, and inclusion. That is also critical, and you'll see more about that in a minute. We exude contagious positivity. We're really proud of our community, and um, you'll find all of us just really enthusiastically supporting this every day. We have a growth mindset, and we act with integrity and empathy. So um, as I mentioned, we have a new geolocation data provider. It's Placer AI. Um, we are, we are uh, in addition to the, we're still maintaining our, the, our previous so that we can look at comparisons year on year. But um, we chose to go with Placer AI primarily because we got a, a grant from the county of Kalamazoo to um, and the way we're from the American Rescue Plan. And the primary way that we are using that grant is to increase our visitor, um, our visitation for multicultural audiences. And Placer AI is a better way to measure that because they can, they can give us a sense of what, our, what we should be doing versus what we are doing and where, how we can grow. Um, but we chose them because they have a huge, one of the benefits, they have a huge retail base. And they are able to measure not just how many devices they track coming into a location, but they can extrapolate that to actual visitors. So they don't just, the previous data provider only measured how many devices came in, but they can extract that to, to understand at any given time how much device coverage that they have. So we can get an actual estimate of visitation. Um, and in addition, this is almost a side benefit, it allows us to look at visitor and resident foot traffic anywhere in the country. And we've been able to use that very effectively with some of our partners. So for example, we sat down with the parks departments at the, at the city of Kalamazoo, the city of Portage in Kalamazoo County, and looked at foot traffic across all the different parks you know, over the years and by day of the week, et cetera. And we were able to compare you know, park to park and gain some learning that way. Um, we sat down with the Arts Council of Kalamazoo and ran some data for them based on Art Hop and events you know, downtown and how different Art Hops performed. I um, provided some data to the um, Parks Department here at the city about holiday programming, for example, and, and also music in the park at Bronson Park on Sundays. Um, we've used it with Portage City for strategic planning and you know, various other places. It's really great data that we can use effectively with our partners, and I think it's really, it's, it's an expense that um, we can have that all of our partners can benefit for, benefit from, but it's a little bit too expensive for any one of our partners to be able to afford the data, so this way we can share it across the community. Um, and this video I'm about to show, one of the things that this data does is it, it, this is called a day in the life. So this is an aggregate video of foot traffic in downtown Kalamazoo. So you can see in the gray area, you've got the geography of downtown highlighted. Um, it shows the foot track in, in downtown Kalamazoo over a 24-hour period. This was measured for basically the last 90 days. So they took the last 90 days and aggregated. And you can see over on the left um, you know, what colors represent what type of place. So the, the blue is home, for example. Um, you can see lodging. You can see work and so forth. So I'm going to hit go, and it's a video. And you're going to want to watch it. And you, if you look at the left, what's going up and down through the course of the day on the left, the bottom is up and down like total visitors within downtown Kalamazoo and then each of those little spots is how many visitors are going to each location. 
So this is now 6 a.m. And now you see more green, so you see work going up. And now we're at 9 a.m. and you can start to see the orange is um, education starting to go up. And then as you get into lunchtime, you see food go up and down, and you're going to see food go back up at, when you get to din the dinner hour. So now we reach the end of the workday, and you see green going down, and you start to see entertainment and nightlife, the, the red there, going up. And you can see where in downtown are kind of the key hot spots. And now we're at 9 p.m., where some of them start to close. And you can see what's, what entertainment spots are still open after 10 a.m., 10 p.m., excuse me. Then you get to around 2 p.m. and 2 a.m. and it's just about ruggers up and under is the only one left open. <laughs> and uh, and then you can see, you know, one of the things we were really curious about, what is that other? Because you see a really big other in the middle of the night, that's Bronson Hospital. Right? So that would be people who aren't at home, they're not visiting, they're not at work. But you can see that in that in that southeast corner of our county, Bronson Hospital. So this is just an example of the data that we have that really helps us understand where people are going, what they're doing, what they're going for. And um, as I say, we're using this with our partners, hopefully to, to great effect. Um, so now I want to give you an update on our strategy. So when I was here a little over a year ago, I talked to you about our strategy. So I'm just going to update, show you what the updates are in some initiatives. Um, we. We've updated our first pillar about winning that casual road trip to be focused on our geography. So casual road trips within, from a drive market remain the sweet spot of visitation to Kalamazoo. So that is still people coming from within a four hour drive. They're coming for on average 1.7 days. They plan their trips on short notice. Nothing has changed there. Um, what we are trying to do is capture more of the people who are driving through. So how can we get people who are otherwise driving through to stop? And we're talking about maybe doing things like with billboards and so forth to, to really leverage our geography. Because we're at the intersection of two highways. People drive through all the time. How do we make sure that they, that they stop and see what great things we have to do? The second is intentionally attract diverse audiences across all work streams. This is the primary use of the ARPA grant that we're getting from the county. This is primarily how we're deploying it. So um, we've identified four multicultural ta targets that we are focused on. Hispanic visitors, black visitors, LGBTQ plus visitors, and visitors with disabilities. So we're still at the early stage of this, but I'll show you in a minute some of the things that we're doing. Um, we're, we're seeking to future-proof what we call meetings and sports event development. So um, many of our businesses, business that we bring in through group meetings and events are very focused in a few areas. For example, 25% of our sports room nights come through hockey. You know, and that's, that's great for hockey, but that doesn't represent youth participation in sports. And then skating is number two. You know, wrestling is number three. So our top three sports that bring in more than 50% of our room nights are highly concentrated, and we really need to think about how do we diversify that. Similarly, on the non-sport side, um, dog shows and car shows represent more of our room nights than they should. We're very, you know, very happy to have that business, of course, and we'll do what we can to keep it. We want to make sure, though, that we're also seeking what are the new hobbies that are coming down, down that we can focus on. Um, resident and partner development, that is, I just learned from our emergency manager that she is bringing family into town, which is great. We always want people to be ambassadors for us, and that is really about how can we continue to help residents be ambassadors for Kalamazoo. Um, and then our partners as well. The partner development comes in very importantly with the attracting diverse audiences because we want to make sure if, when people come that they have a great experience so that we get a good reputation and they want to come back. And then lastly, leading destination development. So obviously there's a, there's a big project that you all know about there and we've got something else in the works too that I'll talk on in just a minute. Um, so in that first of how do we win those casual road trippers, I wanted to give you a, a brief update um, on our unique selling proposition work that um, Jeff Chamberlain has been, was on our working team and the, the city contributed to. Um, what that project was, the, 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 the intent of that project was to develop a unique selling proposition, like a positioning for Kalamazoo County. How do we talk about Kalamazoo, Kalamazoo County in a very compelling way? And obviously the city of Kalamazoo is the biggest part of that county, shares a name, so how we talk about the city matters as well. We interviewed 342 total respondents for this project. Um, we did insight interviews with key stakeholders. Um, we talked to 
other stakeholders, we did community roundtables, we did focus groups, and then we did a quantitative study to make sure we got diverse representation, not just with the city, but across the county. Um, and we came up with what we think is a, uh, a great concept. We put it into quantitative test, it did very well. Whoops, that advanced. Um, yeah, so 98% um, of respondents found the final concept believable, 91 found it to be unique, long-term residents, made them proud and optimistic about the county, and for potential visitors, it made them want to come visit. And those were our action standards. And um, at the appropriate time, I'll come back and I'll tell you more about it once we've been able to take it from just words on a page to something that can translate into action. But we're very excited about that outcome. Um, we do a lot of work with influencers, uh, and we have actually diversified the influencer set that we work with. I wanted to share with you a little bit about that. Um, to talk about the Kalamazoo craft beverage scene, we partnered with Afro Beer Chick who came and did, got fantastic content for us. We choose influencers who will give us great content that then their followers can see and it really help, you know, helps get our message out. Um, for our art and food scene, we chose to work with the Chicago couple, so that's a couple out of Chicago um, that got great, they stayed at the Kalamazoo house and, and really looked, you know, took advantage of what we have to offer in arts and food. For holiday, we worked with a family called From Michigan With Love, and so they came for the tree lighting in Bronson Park and enjoyed all the different fun that we had in the holidays to really get the word out about holidays here in the city of Kalamazoo. And whoops, and then um, for Kalamazoo Craft Beverage Week, we um, partnered with an influencer called Brian McIntosh who came and in, in that, in a, like three days, he went to more Kalamazoo Craft Beverage Week events than you can possibly imagine. And uh, thankfully, I don't think he was driving, and it's good, and he really had a great, had a great time here, and again, gave us great content. For uh, resident and partner development, I wanted to let you know that we are imminently about to launch the Tourism Academy. So for anyone who might have been familiar with the prior Certified Tourism Ambassador Program that Kalamazoo, Discover Kalamazoo had years ago, this is an online version of that that uh, people can, for example, frontline hospitality workers or volunteers with us or anyone can take on their own time, at their own schedule, on a modular basis. And um, we think this is really gonna help all residents of Kalamazoo be even better ambassadors for Discover Kalamazoo and Kalamazoo. And then in terms of destination development, I wanted to obviously celebrate the good news about the event center coming to downtown. Um, this is a view of the rendering from the north looking to the south. And uh, so that's Kalamazoo Avenue that you're seeing there. Whoops. And you can see um, on the left is the basketball courts, on the right the practice sheet device, and then behind that is the arena and event space. So Discover Kalamazoo is really excited about this initiative. Um, I actually had someone at a trade show last week with diagrams because now we can host events that we other, up until now have not been able to host whether it's because they require that amount of flat floor space um, or that amount of performance space. And we have coming up in August, Discover Kalamazoo will be going to Indianapolis to talk to the NCAA about all the events that they will be booking for for 19, or 2026 to 2029 in conjunction with Western and K College. Because now we have a space, we could potentially talk about hosting big NCAA events, which would be great for our community. Speaking of big events, I thought I would just update you on some big events that are coming to our community. Um, oh, and actually, if you'll excuse me for one moment. I brought with, with me, so you can pass this around, an example of every month we send a postcard to our partners, primarily restaurants, you know, but not only retail shops and that kind of thing to let them know when there's big events coming in town so that they can staff appropriately, um, you know, buy things appropriately, you know, they might want to consider adjusting their opening hours. So we do this every month and I thought you might be interested to see it. This happens to be an example from April. Um, so some big events, and the first one on that postcard there is the Kalamazoo Crusader Cup. So that is a soccer tournament that is coming. Um, this is, you know, it doesn't have a lot of visibility to the public, really, but it is a big event that brings a lot of teams here to Kalamazoo, and we sincerely hope that the weather improves for them, for those poor soccer players. 
Um, and then also this weekend is the Kalamazoo Marathon, the Ziegler Marathon back to Kalamazoo. Um, and we're excited that the route, the full marathon is back, the route starts and ends in downtown, and it actually goes all the way to Portage. So they're gonna go around Stryker and see some of um, Portage there, which is, we think, a, a great venue to showcase more of our community. Also back for the first time since the pandemic is the I International Congress on Medieval Studies. So um, this is, actually is one of the highest economic impact events for the county every year, and we haven't had it since 2019. So the team is very excited to have this back. We get scholars not just from around the country, but internationally for this event, and uh, it's a really big deal for us. Um, we, as I, you probably know, is we are the home of the United Kennel Club, it's the world headquarters for United Kennel Club, and this is their national championship dog show that happens at the fairgrounds uh, in June every year. If you have not been to this event and you have any interest in dogs, I would highly recommend it. It is a hoot because the dogs, it's not just a beauty pageant, it's the total dog. They do dock jumping and lure chasing and agility and scent work and obedience and it is, it is a lot of fun to watch. And then uh, Doki Dokan is coming downtown. So uh, this past weekend we, Kalamazoo, hosted the Grand Rapids Comic Con. Not sure if you're aware of that. Um, they needed a, a venue and our Kalamazoo County Parks was happy to host them at the Expo Center. We hope that they come back every year. Um, but we also have the Doki Dokan, which is hosted in Kalamazoo every year that happens at the Radisson. So that weekend, if you're walking around downtown, you'll see fun people in costumes. And then, of course, this is the 80th year of the USTAs. And I often, when I speak to community groups, I challenge them to name an American men's tennis player that has not played in Kalamazoo. And I have yet to have anyone find one for me. Um, you know, this is, this is a showcase event for us. So these are players that, you know, they are all familiar with Kalamazoo. It's a, it's a young male tennis player's dream to play in Kalamazoo. And this is the 80th tournament this year, coming up in August. And then I don't expect you to be able to read this, but this is just some associations that we have hosted here over the last couple of years. Um, and it's not even a complete list because I couldn't fit them all on the page. But the reason I mention that is because there is literally an association for everything and they all have meetings. And every association has a leader. And in August, we are hosting the Michigan Society of Association Executives. So the leaders of all those associations who are gonna be planning meetings every year, you know, for the next five, 10 years, they're all gonna be right here in Kalamazoo in August. So this is, um, while in and of itself, that event is not have a huge economic impact, if we give them an outstanding experience, it could have a long-term residual economic impact. So that's a really big deal for us to host here. And on a similar note about a really big deal, this is an exciting announcement that was made last week. In 2024, we will be hosting the Pure Michigan Governor's Conference on Tourism. So this is, um, and this is the, 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 like, the big event in our industry. Um, this past week it was held in Grand Rapids and people come not just from around the state, but we get a lot of um, agency partners and a lot of media come to that event as well. We got several media requests about the event center and so forth coming out of that meeting last time. So um, it'll be, it's great to have them here in Kalamazoo. And again, we hope to give them a phenomenal experience. It, it, the host hotel is the Radisson and we're ha having a reception at Bell's. So showcasing some of our, some of the highlights of Kalamazoo there. And um, the, uh, the Air Zoo and the Gilmore Car Museum also partnered with us to help secure this event. So we're very excited to have it in our community. So, with that, I, f if, uh, I feel like I might have time to just talk about one more thing. Um, at the governor's conference last week, we had, um, actually, if anyone is a Ted Lasso fan, we were kind of the Roy Kent of the governor's conference. Kalamazoo was the Roy Kent, and, and if you think about what they chant when they see Roy Kent, that you'll get that reference. Um, we hosted a couple panels. Um, I was fortunate enough to have uh, Jonas Peterson from South of Michigan First come and participate on a panel that I helped host to talk about the economic impact of hospitality on the economic development community. Um, we hosted a panel on sports and then um, Dana Wagner on my team had the chance to speak to the MDOT community. You know, we have MDOT welcome centers across our state and the media were together in one and she spoke with them uh, she had three minutes, and so she chose three things to talk about to them to highlight, showcase our community. And she talked about how we now have nine beer gardens in the county, including the new Steins Park and Portage there. There are 12 venues for free music in the county, 
many of them here in, in, in right in downtown Kalamazoo, but in the city of Kalamazoo, there will be more than 100 summer, free summer con concerts coming up, which is absolutely amazing when you think of that. And then we have 15 public golf courses across the county, um, which is remarkable that there are 15 courses where people don't need to be a member, they can just walk up and play including the 2021 National Golf Course of the Year in Stoughton Bray there at Gull Lake View. So um, that is how Dana described our county to the MDOT. So if people are stopping at New Buffalo and they're saying, you know, I'm on my way wherever, but I'm, I'm going to make a stop, you know, what, what is there to do on my way, you know, to give them an answer. So if they come into the summer, they have great things to say about Kalamazoo. And then I was fortunate enough to get um, a special uh, speaking opportunity where my constraints were that I was given 15 slides and 15 seconds per slide. And I could talk about anything I wanted. And I thought you might be interested to hear how I talked about Kalamazoo to that audience last week. So um, I'm going to use note cards because I memorized it for last week and I've since used up that space in my brain for other things. So I, uh, I have note cards. But um, this is how I described Kalamazoo to last week to the Pure Michigan Governor's Conference on Tourism. I just, I chose to talk about the perform, the profound impact of a warm welcome here in Kalamazoo. The original inhabitants of Kalamazoo were indigenous people. Then it became true, sadly, that only privileged people got to choose where to live. Thankfully, while by no means perfect, today most people get to choose. And today I'm gonna to talk about some people who chose Kalamazoo. One of our most famous residents, William Upjohn, chose to stay in Kalamazoo pretty much his whole life. He went on to found the Upjohn Company, and now Kalamazoo was home to the COVID vaccine from the Pfizer Company. Another famous resident, Homer Stryker, an inventor of hospital beds, also grew up in Kalamazoo. He tried living in other places in Michigan, but he eventually decided to return to his roots in Kalamazoo, and therefore Kalamazoo is the home of the global headquarters of Stryker. At a time when Irish people were not welcome everywhere, a man by the name of Gilmore came from Ireland to Kalamazoo and felt so welcome, he invited his brother from Ireland to join him. They founded the Gilmore Department Store, an institution in downtown Kalamazoo for generations. Orville Gibson came to Kalamazoo from New York. He went on to found the Gibson Mandolin Guitar Manufacturing Company in Kalamazoo, and as a result, everyone from Les Paul to Roy Rogers to Jimi Hendrix played their music on guitars made in Kalamazoo. When other Michigan universities would not accept Merz Tate, Western not only welcomed her, they gave her a scholarship. She went on to become the first African American to get a degree from Oxford, and the first black woman to get a PhD from Harvard and Radcliffe. Larry Bell, who grew up in Chicago, was driving by Kalamazoo with a friend. He visited Kalamazoo College, decided to go there, and stayed in Kalamazoo. As a result, Kalamazoo became the home of the first craft brewery east of Colorado. Jamari Bogan visited from New Jersey, felt welcome at Western, and stayed in Kalamazoo after he graduated. He is now developing an amazing property with affordable housing and childcare. The impact of people feeling welcome in Kalamazoo doesn't stop there. Anonymous residents have created the Kalamazoo Promise, which guarantees every student of Kalamazoo Public Schools a free college education, and the Foundation for Excellence, which covers revenue gaps so the city of Kalamazoo doesn't have to impose an income tax. And people who chose Kalamazoo haven't just helped residents. They've invested in things to attract new visitors. Thanks to some of the families I've mentioned, we have the Gilmore Car Museum and the Air Zoo, two amazing world-class attractions which bring in new visitors. And the Gilmore Piano Festival, which, as NPR put it, hosts the largest gathering of piano talent in the Western Hemisphere. And the families of people who were welcomed by Kalamazoo are continuing to have a profound impact on our future. It was recently announced that Kalamazoo will be the home to a 100% privately funded event center downtown, a project that will draw even more visitors and potential future residents to our community. Like how a Canadian property developer named Jeff Nicholson visited the area to see his wife's family, felt welcome, decided to invest in Kalamazoo, and is now turning the former Gibson Guitar Factory into a hard rock hotel, which will draw even more visitors. But now, a thought experiment. Imagine an alternate universe. What if Larry Bell and Jamari Bogan and the Gilmore brothers hadn't felt welcome in Kalamazoo? More importantly, 
Who were all the other Larry Bells and Jamari Bogans who did visit Kalamazoo and didn't feel welcome? What did we miss out on? That is why Discover Kalamazoo is firmly committed to warmly welcoming all visitors, because you never know who might be the next Merz Tate or Orville Gibson. A warm welcome can have a profound impact. That is why all are welcome in Kalamazoo. Thank you. Wow. A lot of energy. Anybody have any questions for Jane at this point? I, I, I have a comment. Yeah, Commissioner Hess. Wow. So I'm glad you put that in your mission statement. You know, just, just wow. Like, we know all these things, but to hear them all in that presentation yeah. was fantastic. Is that anywhere on your website with your voiceover? Is that anywhere on your website or on like a YouTube that you can put out there? That's gotta, that's gotta be made public. That's gotta go out to all of Kalamazoo. Um, and I, I just wanna say that, you know, you say you don't know what's different for 2021. I think you had just been in uh, place at the, as the <laughs> head of Discover Kalamazoo for about a year and, and you made it happen, Jane. So, so please uh, take a, a uh, a, a grateful heart from, from this girl for saying yes to Kalamazoo and for leading this organization into the greatness that it is. I mean, I've seen a tremendous difference in growth in Kalamazoo since you've been here, so thank you. Um, thank you. And then, so y you did bring up something with the postcard. Um, I was talking to Harry Phillips from um, uh, the State Theater and he was saying that he's trying to work with downtown merchants to let them, or uh, restaurants especially, to let them know when they have a big show uh, to make sure that they're staffed fully and correctly. So are you, is that a part of what you're doing as well? No, that's a very good point. We sh I mean, we do put some, like we have Chelsea Handler on the May postcard, for example. She but, was hilarious. Yeah, <laughs> missed that one. But, um, uh, so we do we do put some on there, but not all of them. That's a, I think that's a it's a good build. But so the board teachers mm -hmm. came in the mm -hmm. board teachers comedy tour mm -hmm. sold out state yeah. theater, and yeah. there were teachers on Thursday night all over downtown yeah. Kalamazoo. So yeah. and they were visiting from the whole region. So yeah. 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 Um, so yeah, uh, very good. Stay in touch with Harry about the what's going on at the state, but you know, the, the increased communication that we've seen from your office and, and the things that we know that are coming down the pike and, and the things that you've given to us here are just another great reason to call Kalamazoo home. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Hess. Any other questions or comments from the team? Yeah, Chris, Commissioner Prado. Sure. I just had two curious questions, if you don't mind. <clears throat> One of them was just, uh, you mentioned some influencers and how you <clears throat> identify folks that would be good fits to come here and kind of test us out. Mm -hmm. um, how does that usually work? Is it just kind of organically happen or do you have members of your team who actually will reach out to them and say, hey, you know, we'll put you up in a hotel, invite you to some things. How, how does that work exactly? I'm just curious. The vast majority of the time, it's Dana Wagner on my team identifying what is, what are we, what's the gap we want to fill? What, who do we, who do we want to get our message out to about what mm -hmm. and find someone who has the right audience who talks about the right stuff? <clears throat> And um, that is the vast majority of the time how that works. So it's targeted. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, the other question I had for you is I <clears throat> learned after the fact actually about Comic-Con was here this last weekend. And uh, not to completely nerd myself out, but I actually had some friends who were in their 70s and they just thought it would be kind of fun to go check it out. They said that there was parking all the way over to the sheriff's office. There were so many people that were there. Awesome. And I was curious, it was identified as Grand Rapids Comic-Con and it's here in Kalamazoo. Mm -hmm. And I was just curious, you know, if you've heard any response from the organizers in terms of like interest in returning and maybe calling it Kalamazoo Comic-Con uh, because we can host uh, it, um, unlike our neighbor to the north. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. I was just uh, cu curious on your uh, thoughts and what you've heard from, from that particular event. I have not had any feedback yet about how it went. I know that we staffed an information table and. We set my team on the mission to give them the best possible, you know, experience to, with the hopes that they would that they would stay. But of course, obviously, there's a lot of things that you know that drive their overall experience and um, you know where the, how they decide where to go. But I haven't I haven't heard the feedback yet. But we would love to see them stay very yeah. much. I heard it was a very family friendly event, and that there were as many folks that were, came here from 
you know, like the Grand Rapids area, because mm -hmm. it was the Grand Rapids Comic Con, yeah. then we're from here locally. So uh, anecdotally, hearing from my uh, older friends, uh, they said that was, you know, really impressive. Good. And so definitely something to keep on the radar and see if we can steal the name. Excellent. <clears throat> Thanks. Anyone else? No. Oh. So thank you once again. Appreciate your work every single day. And thanks for sharing your enthusiasm thank you. with us. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Yes. Manager Smith. Next, we will switch gears and get a, an update on our emergency operations plan by uh, Ms. Brandy James. Brandy? Hello, Welcome. everyone. Thank Hello. you. Thank you. Um, thank you for letting me come and uh, speak to you about this. I am not as charismatic as Jane, <laughs> um, and my material is not as interesting, but hopefully I've made it short and sweet, and we can um, get you the information you need. Um, let's see. So like I said, I just want to make it short and sweet. I want to give you just a, a broad overview of what the plan uh, covers. It has been, what, nine months in the making, just trying to update it. Um, I will tell you that I followed the state police uh, Homeland Security and Emergency Management guideline on what needs to go in there so that I'm, I'm working towards getting us in PA 390 compliance. Uh, so then we become our own program and grants become available to us and things like that. Um, so if you see here, I'm going to modify it um, every year, um, as things come up, if we have events and I see that something needs to be changed, I will change it immediately so that I'm not scrounging at the end of the year to try to figure out what it is needs to be updated. Um, but I will definitely review it every year um, just to make sure we're not missing anything. Um, and also it needs to be submitted to state police um, EM HSD, which like I said is the Emergency Management Homeland Security Department every four years uh, for them to review and approve it um, to make sure it's compatible with what FEMA requires of us. So the plan format um, consists of the basic plan, the appendices, um, the ESF functions, which means emergency management, I'm sorry, emergency support functions, and support annexes and hazard specific incidents. Um, in the basic plan, the, the biggest thing that um, we need to cover in the basic plan, I'm hoping that you all can uh, kind of glance over it and review it. I will be emailing it to everybody tomorrow. Um, I will let you know that it's probably 200, 300 pages. <laughs> so I'm sure it'll be more like a skim through. Um, I went from 30 something pages, I believe, to 200 to 300 pages, which is, I guess, why it took me nine months to do it. Um, so there is a letter of promulgation. I hope I said that correctly. It, it is what would need to be signed off on to say that this plan is approved by the commission, um, by the city, and it's what we will follow during emergency activations. There is also another portion in the basic plan that covers every single person in the commission, um, every <coughs> department head within the city, and it just shows that they have received it and they've reviewed it and they agree with it. Um, just so that, you know, we make sure it's, it's distributed across the board to anybody that would, um, would work and uh, try to serve the citizens during a disaster or any kind of emergency event. So the appendices, I have nine of those, and those cover topics such as um, the authorities at the federal level, at the state level, and here locally, as well as the county. Uh, just it, it shows all of the laws um, that are put into place and ordinances that are put into place to show what our authorities are during these events. There is also uh, an appendix for the succession of directors for emergency management. It just lets you know if, if, the, if the top person is not available, uh, who would be the next in line to take care of everything and have the ultimate responsibility. Um, of course, we also have a glossary of terms. We have acronyms because in emergency management, there is a ton of acronyms. Um, and me being in this for 20 plus years, I can just r rattle those out and not realize that nobody knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> um, we also have the Michigan Emergency Disaster Declaration Process. It shows us how we must go about declaring and how we've got to push it to the county and then the county pushes it to the state and then the state will push it to the feds and all of those have different um, 
um, conse not consequences, um, different outcomes of what those mean uh, as far as like funding and uh, getting resources to help us respond to an event. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I also have in there the uh, Kalamazoo Code, Chapter 12, the emergency management that established this program for us and established my position um, and the um, just the process of how we will go about doing these things. And um, we have the ICS organizational structure and the elements that make up that structure, um, just to show you how we're supposed to um, plan and, um, and execute uh, for these events. Um, community lifelines is something new. I actually had not heard of it until I came here because the county has kind of adopted it as um, their way of keeping track of everything during a disaster and, and pushing that out to us so that we know what's going on. And so there's a section in there that describes that. Um, we used it during the blizzard at Christmas and it worked very well. Uh, it's color coded to let you know whether there's critical, uh, critical things that need to be done in certain lifelines, which is transportation, um, power, hospitals, medical, you know, stuff like that. And it just, it's color coded so that you know whether everything's good, um, if there's some things, some actions we need to take, or if there's some critical needs. So, um, and then it further describes everything for you. Um, and then the last ap appendix is just where I list out and describe our MOUs, which are memorandums of understanding, our CEAs, which are cooperative endeavor agreements, and uh, mutual aid agreements. Our biggest one is um, MAVIS, which is pretty much our search and rescue, our, our TRT, which is technical rescue teams. Um, we have um, groups all over the state and the, the country that are part of this um, this mutual aid agreement, and if, if we have a need, we make a phone call and they spin up and they respond as fast as possible to come help us. Um, we actually had an, an exercise here a couple weeks ago um, where we activated the Mavis crew out of um, Washtenaw County, I believe is how you say that, and it went really well. Uh, so we plan on exercising that again and um, we're doing an, an after action report that can be reviewed if you'd like to see that you can contact me for that. So then you have the emergency support functions. Um, that covers, I believe, 17 emergency support functions. Again, it's transportation, um, law enforcement, fire, medical, um, you name it, any kind of critical need sector is covered in these. And it just, I have it written out to where you know exactly what their duties are. Um, or at least their overall duties. You know, of course, they're going to get more smaller ones, but this is the, the broader picture so that um, everybody knows what to expect from those groups. Um, then we get to really the meat and potatoes, um, the hazard-specific annexes. Uh, there's six of them right now. I plan on having quite a few more, but I only covered the six that were required by the state for us to have a um, compliant emergency operation plan, and those include catastrophic events, which is uh, pretty much if we had an event where we had mass um, deaths and how to handle that. Um, and then I did um, dam failure and flooding caused by that dam failure, uh, hazard materials annex, extreme temperatures annex, which we already had in place um, when, I, when I came on, but it has been updated. Um, and we've, we've gotten with the county to make sure that our plans um, correlate, you know, that they, they're, they, they work well together. Um, the severe weather event annex, that covers every possible severe weather. Um, blizzard, ice storm, tornado, um, high winds, thunderstorms, um, anything you can think of. And that's one of the ones that I would appreciate everybody kind of looking over. I'm new to the area, so I don't know exactly what hits this area. Um, so if I'm missing anything, please let me know. Um, and then I also have weapons of mass destruction and terrorism. So I wanted to let you know that, um, oh, and I skipped the support. Um, I haven't even been going through the slides, I'm sorry. 
um, the, the support annex was a communications annex, which just covers all of our um, communication processes, whether it's phone, computer, radio, um, all of those things. It does have some law enforcement sensitive or for official use only information in it. So the, what I'm giving to you and that will be available to the public does have those critical, Im critical information that's on it kind of blocked out and it says for official use only. We will have the original in the office to use during an event, but we, we just we can't get that law enforcement sensitive stuff out to the public. Um, so I just want to let you know that it's I believe it's also in the weapons of mass destruction annex. So, like I said, we only have six of those <clears throat> because they were required, excuse me. Um, but some of the other ones that I plan on doing immediately, um, I've already done a bunch of research and pulled some stuff down to get some ideas, would of course be mass power outages. I know that that's been something that's affected this area and Michigan um, in the last couple decades. I, I remember there being like a brownout or something years ago. Um, my grandparents were here, so you know I knew about that and how it affected them. Um, of course, active shooter is, is a big hot topic right now. Um, and even before these incidents that have happened recently, it's always been something that needs to be covered. Um, but I want to get with all of the schools um, to talk about floor plans and procedures on how to handle these things before we actually write a plan. And we're already in talks with them um, to do that. I'm now on the committee for the school board. Um, for emergency management, and I've been to a couple meetings and we're going over all of that now, so that'll help me build that annex. And then th another one is earthquakes. Um, I know that's not like a big deal here. Um, I, everyone keeps telling me, oh, we don't have earthquakes, but we are on fault lines. So I still wanna cover it, and as I've said in, in previous presentations, you wanna plan for the worst and hope for the best, so I wanna cover every possible scenario. Um, that one may take a little longer um, because it's not as important, but um, I will definitely be doing the active shooter first, then the mass power outages, and then work on that one. And if any of you have any ideas of any other hazard-specific annexes, I would appreciate, um, you know, just dropping me an email or giving me a call and let me know what your thoughts are, and we can work that in. So here's my contact information. I believe all of you already have that. Um, like I said, feel free to contact me through phone, my cell, um, or email just to, to give me some feedback or ask questions. Um, I'm available anytime, and uh, we'll, we'll work through it. Um, is there any questions? Uh, Vice Mayor Cooney. Thanks, Brandy. It looks like you're doing an awful lot of good work here. <laughs> um, I know the county has an emergency uh, yes. preparedness. What is our relationship with them? Do you talk with them? How's that work? Yes, um, so Mike Korfman is um, my counterpart there, and uh, he and I stay in constant contact. I actually was in a meeting with him today. Uh, we talked about how we need to, once it gets warmer, we need to set up a lunch so that we can just sit down and talk about some things. Um, but yeah, he and I stay in constant contact, right. and right. his staff and I stay in con constant oh, okay. contact. Um, okay. We're continually in meetings together. Um, we're always running things by each other, making phone calls and stuff like that. Great, thank you. You're welcome. Other questions for our coordinator? Oh, thank you. Yeah, appreciate it. Christian Pringle, do you have a question? Are you um, connected and in touch with the, I'm trying to remember what the acronym stands for, but the KCRC uh, through yes. a different place? Yes, with <clears throat> Bren, yes. Um, he holds meetings, um, I th think it's once a month, and I, we have one this Friday. Um, so I typically try to be on those meetings unless I have something else going on. But um, yes, I stay in contact with Brent as well. During the ice storm, we offered him a spot in the EOC because he was without power and, and um, KCRC or Griffin Place was without power as well. Mm -hmm. He couldn't get out, but um, he knows that he has a spot there. He's more than welcome. And yes, we coordinate with those. That's great. With those I know groups. They need just, to, just a reminder what that acronym stands for. I'm trying to, I, was trying to, I think Cal it's Kalamazoo County Resource. Response Consortium. Response Consortium, yeah, there we yes. go. There we go. But yeah, sorry. I, Apologize. I've had to say it so I was, much I was that looking now it's there. right now before I was going to ask because <laughs> yeah. I, I hate when people use acronyms, but but I, it's a really valuable resource because oh, yes. I know in my day job uh, we have a member uh, attend it because it's helpful with how, how to navigate uh, nonprofit resources as well if, if we need to activate ever as a community. 
Yes, yes. And he actually held a tabletop exercise a couple months ago. And I was pretty impressed with how he completely understands the uh, incident command system and um, was able to incorporate that into the exercise. So hopefully, um, if anything happens in the future, those, those, they're on board. So he's doing a good job with that, the ICS stuff. Yeah, and I might have missed it as well when you were t speaking about the different scenarios of things that could happen in Michigan, but mm -hmm. uh, flooding, uh, yes, it seems to be, you know, particularly in the last, you know, let's say five years has been a pretty big issue for the community, it's especially some of our lower income neighborhoods are right. particularly disproportionately impacted with their homes. Okay. Um, and that would just be something that came to mind. Uh, okay. if it's not already. Um, I will tell you it's covered in two places right now, but if, if you look at it and, and think that I need to add more, please let me know. It's covered in the dam failure flooding and it's also covered in the severe weather, weather flooding or severe weather event. Super. Commissioner Hess. So, Brandy, thank you for that. Appreciate it. I, I, it's nice to know someone's at the switch. Um, what is the timeline for us to be able to peruse the document and, and, and sign on to it? Is there a particular timeline? Do we all sign at the same time? Uh, what, is, what does that look like? Um, so, I'm going to send it to you tomorrow. Um, hopefully first thing in the morning. And um, you can look at it from now till, <clears throat> sorry, of course I lose my voice today. Um, between now and I guess May 1st is what I'm told is when it will need to come back up and, and get signed off on. Um, I will make plenty of changes if I need to prior to that and keep sending it out so that, so that you'll see the changes. Um, but what will happen is once, once the commission approves it, then um, the mayor will sign it and a couple other people will sign it. And then after that, um, as soon as I get that part done, then I'll just start forwarding out or bringing it to all of, all of the people that need to sign off on it. Just try to knock that out in a couple of days, getting all of those out to everybody. Yeah, you're welcome. Other questions, team? Right, so yes, you are enthusiastic about this. So don't, <laughs> un don't underplay yourself. I think it's important. Uh, J Jane just impresses me with how how well she speaks and uh, her her interest in, in what she's speaking about. She does a really good job. So she does, but your interest in this comes yes. through. So <laughs> okay. I appreciate well, thank you. that. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, and I suppose uh, in some ways people could imagine well, you're planning for when bad things happen, how can you be enthusiastic about that? But, you know, there is nothing better, and sometimes the thing we always neglect to do, you know, is fix that roof when it's not raining. Right. And uh, that is obviously a very, very important thing. And I, more than that, I think, is keeping this as a living, useful document and, and planning tool as we go forward. Yes. Commissioner Hess. Brings up another question. So how do, when we, if we intersect Discover Kalamazoo with our emergency preparedness plan, um, are, is there, what about if an emergency happens when we have visitors in town, which we always do? Yes. Um, is there a plan to reach out to hotels and, and perhaps like Discover Kalamazoo, what's going on, where's your people, you know, how can we help you there? Yes, yes. So um, it's not written yet. Um, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that because I've, I've, Actually, it's kind of gone by the wayside, wayside while I was trying to get the requirements done. Um, so I'll make note of that, that that's, I need to make sure it's on the list. But um, Jane and I have met before. Um, I went to her office to discuss all these sort of things. And she sends me updates of the events that are going on. And, um, and she actually just sent it to me today. Today she sent me the update. So um, I will always know what events are going on in our area and actually in the whole county because that could affect us as well. Um, and she lets me know even when there's conventions at the hotels. So I'll even know those and how many participants they plan on having, stuff like that. So yes. Thank you. Good question. So yeah. these are perfect counterparts tonight, right? Yes. The two presentations. <laughs> uh, Guess we're set. Thank you once again. We're lucky to have you here working with us at the city. Appreciate your efforts. Yes. Yes. Thank you very much. Yes. Right. Manager Risman, anything else? Nothing else, Your Honor.
Okay, thank you very much. This is the opportunity then for commissioner comments for our committee of the whole meeting. Just a reminder for anyone who may be watching, there will be an opportunity for commissioner comments at the end of our business meeting, which will be starting in about an hour. Any comments for the good of the order? <laughs> I'm glad you're keeping the microphone off while you're making those comments, Commissioner Wallace. Uh Seeing no commissioner comments, then we will be, this meeting is adjourned and we'll be gathering back here in about an hour for our business meeting.